tonight, four more years, Labor celebrates a resounding election victory, leaving the Canberra Liberals to ask what went so wrong. In this most challenging of years, Canberrans have turned to a strong and experienced government. Tonight marks the end of a tough campaign in a tough year. The big winners, the Greens, set to win up to six seats and have a much greater say in how the ACT is governed. Tonight, Canberra has voted for a better normal. They... Also tonight, in New Zealand's election, Jacinda Ardern leads her party to a landslide victory. And the Wallabies fail to break their Eden Park hoodoo, losing in the second Bledisloe Cup test. Yuma, good evening. Dan Borsha with ABC News. Labor will govern for four more years in the ACT after a resounding victory in yesterday's election. It's the sixth consecutive win for the Labor Party in Canberra, extending their reign to 23 years in government. With about 80% of votes counted, three seats are still in doubt. ACT political reporter Tom Lowry has been following the campaign. Tom, Labor weren't the only victors. Dan, it was a very big night for the ACT Greens too. They dreamed during the campaign they might pick up, if they had a great election night, four seats. They're now looking at five, the possibility of even six. So the next ACT government is going to have a much greener tinge to it. But the situation remains the same at the top. Labor's Andrew Barr will be the Chief Minister once more. He might have been confident going into yesterday, but he probably didn't expect this outcome. Hand in hand and grinning from ear to ear. Andrew Barr cemented Labor's leadership in the ACT. In this most challenging of years, Canberrans have turned to a strong and experienced government. And in 2020, Canberrans have voted to return a Labor government. Victory sprung from an unexpected spot as early results in Brindabella broke left. Labor is doing much better in Brindabella on these numbers than the Liberal Party did last time. That doesn't look great. It is, I mean, it's not the sort of figures that we would be expecting to see in, in Brindabella. And before 8pm, the experts had seen enough. The Labor Party and the Greens, I believe, have won the election. It's just rather difficult to be certain of the numbers. For the Liberals, the most difficult of defeats. Tonight marks the end of a tough campaign in a tough year. An election they hoped would be close was a comprehensive loss. It has been an honour to be the leader of the Canberra Liberals. It is the greatest honour of my life. As of this afternoon, Labor had claimed 10 of the Assembly's 25 seats. The Liberals have eight, and the Greens a remarkable four. Three remain in doubt as counting continues. Five sitting MLAs failed in their bid for re-election. The Liberals' Andrew Wall, James Milligan and Candace Birch, and Labor's Beck Cody and Deepak Raj Gupta. At least five new faces look set to join the Assembly. The Greens' Andrew Braddock, Emma Davidson, and Rebecca Vassarotti, the Liberals' Leanne Carsley and Labor's Marisa Patterson. Some of the new faces are already on the job as Labor celebrates its sudden success. I think we have busted the mythology that, uh, that Tuggeranong uh, and Southern Canberra is somehow a Liberal Party stronghold. But as Labor gained in the South, it lost in the North. We've got some lessons to learn in Yerribee and I acknowledge the strong result uh, for Alistair Coe and the Canberra Liberals in that seat. Mr Barr also sought to put to bed any suggestion he might call it quits early in the term. You sign up for a four-year contract. Uh, I'll make decisions about, about my future closer to 2024. For now, time to savour a sixth straight victory. Tom Lowry, ABC News, Canberra.
Perhaps the biggest winner of yesterday's election was the Greens. The party smashed expectations to win votes all over the ACT, securing at least four seats. Remarkably, though, the party could end up winning as many as six, with three seats still undecided. The party has already begun negotiating how they will use their larger footprint in the Legislative Assembly. Here's Tom Maddox. A very happy party with an even bigger seat at the table. Well, hello, friends. How are you all? It was an outcome no one really saw coming. Well, I am absolutely thrilled to have you members joining us in the Assembly. In fact, After crunching some complex numbers... I've just spent the five last five minutes going to, through five a 3 size spreadsheets. <laughs> Analyst Anthony Green gave the Greens the news they wanted to hear. 11 Labor, five Green... Six Green and uh, eight Liberals. The party hasn't yet secured those six seats, but it's sewn up four, doubling the numbers they had during the last term of government. Leader Shane Rattenbury's seat was never in doubt, but with Carolyn Lakuta retiring, Murrumbidgee was up for grabs. The vibe I got from the electorate of Murrumbidgee would be that things are likely to stay exactly as they are. Emma Davidson is the new face in Murrumbidgee. Um. <laughs> Wow, this is not the result I was quite expecting. Andrew Braddock has picked up Yerby. My problem is the speech I had planned to deliver, I have just had to throw out and I'm going to have to make it up on the run now. And Rebecca Vassarotti has gained in Karajong. We're really hopeful um, that we could play a, a much stronger role in the Assembly. The celebrations continued today, with new members rubbing shoulders with those nervously waiting for the next batch of counting. This is a tough week for those candidates who sit on the borderline. Joe Clay is a chance in Ginandera. The final seat in Brindabella is on a knife's edge. Just a handful of votes separates Labor's Tamus Werner Gibbings and the Greens' Jonathan Davis. Surprisingly, the party's strongest swing came from the Southern electorate. But too often, the Greens have been characterised as being an inner city party. With larger representation in the Assembly, the party's members have already begun working out how they can wield their newfound power. We have to make some big choices about do we sit on the crossbench as a group of six, do we continue to play a role in the ministry there, the conversations that we'll have with first our membership and then with the Labor Party. Andrew Barr has already ruled out making a Greens MLA Deputy Chief Minister and has made it clear the party won't dictate which ministerial portfolios it gets. Tricky negotiations aside, Labor can only govern with the backing of the Greens and the party will doubtless seek to make the most of that. Tom Maddox, ABC News, Canberra. With just over 80% of the vote counted, at this stage there's been a 3.4% swing to the Greens. That looks likely to translate to four seats with another two possible. Shane Rattenbury is the Greens leader and was a Cabinet Minister in the last government and he joins me now. Thanks for your company. Does this effectively make you another opposition party? You and my Dan, well, we're very excited with this result. Uh, it's a reflection of, we think, putting forward a really positive and ambitious agenda and getting out and chatting to people about that. And I feel after the year that 2020 has been, people are really looking for a bold new vision of trying to address some of the underlying problems that were there before, whether it's dealing with climate change or housing affordability. People are looking for answers on those things. And I think now is the moment to really take a step to address them. Well, you talked about a policy reset with Labor. What does that mean? What does it look like? It is about prioritising the areas we need to tackle. Governments are going to have real budget problems in the next few years, but we need to make sure that the spending we do as part of the recovery delivers not just economic stimulus for the sake of it, but real social dividends, and that's where something like a big investment in social and community housing can deliver that stimulus, but also a lasting benefit for our community. I want to delve into that in a moment, sure. but are the Greens seeking a number of Cabinet seats and specific portfolios? We haven't actually made a decision on that yet. One of the things is we are a very grassroots party. We have a meeting booked with our party membership on uh, the middle of this week. We all sit down and say to them, what do they want us to do with this? Our members are really excited. They've all got a lot of ideas. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that conversation. It's one of the real, I guess, advantages of being a member of the Greens is you get to have a, a say in these discussions. So is sitting outside of Cabinet and a formal arrangement an option for the Greens? It is one of the options that is open to us. It's what we did in the Seventh Assembly when we first won the balance of power here. Since then we've had two terms where we've played a role in the Cabinet. I think that is part of both an internal preference of what we'd like to do 
and also part of the conversation with the Labor Party. When it comes to the policies of which there were many you announced in the election campaign, which of those are non-negotiable in these negotiations? Yeah, look, it is, I guess, impossible at the start to say anything is non-negotiable. It comes down to looking at both our policies, uh, the Labor policies, where we can find common ground, but there will be some unique things we want to bring forward. We've spoken repeatedly about the need for more social and community housing, as I've touched on. Uh, climate change action is obviously central to the things that are important to us. We were disappointed during the election campaign to see no real policies addressing either the transport or gas emissions in the ACT, which are our two big sources of greenhouse emissions. So they're the sort of issues we'll be putting on the agenda. You put forward one of your policies, a home for all, which mm. talks about uh, really housing for all Canberrans, costed at about $450 million over four years. Is that something that you would be willing to go into uh, this arrangement fighting for? And if so, how do you pay for that? Absolutely, we have to fight for that. You know, through the federal budget, we saw so many major economists as well as significant community organisations saying Australia desperately needs more affordable housing. Uh, the ACT government has budget over the next few years in its capital reserves to make this sort of investment and the failure of the federal government to invest in that last week in the budget process makes it all the more important that the state government, or the territory government in this case, steps into that breach. Mm. Very, very good to have you along. Many thanks. Thanks, Dan. Shane Rattenbury there, the ACT Greens leader, joining us here on the news. Uh, Tom Lowry was listening into that and rejoins me now. Tom, given what you've just heard, just how different might the next four years be? Dan, it's pretty clear this is going to be a pretty different government and a much greener government. It's Shane Rattenbury's laid out there that they're going to seek change in a bunch of different policy areas. Housing seems to be chief among them. But the first decision they have to make is what sort of government, what sort of shape does the next government take? Are they going to sit inside the tent as they have over the past four years, perhaps take up two ministry positions and actually write government policy? Or do they sit outside the tent over on the crossbench and just negotiate policy through the Assembly with Labor in a different kind of position? So certainly negotiations are going to be very interesting between Labor and the Greens over the next few weeks and Labor aren't going to have it all their own way. Yeah, it seems all those options are on the table. Alastair Coe, on the other hand, hinted last night that his time at the helm of the Liberals may be over. So who could take his place? Dan, I see three real options here for the Liberals, the first of which is Alistair Coe himself. He absolutely has not ruled out recontesting the leadership. He's young, he's ambitious and he loves politics and he would be a strong contender if he runs again. The next and most obvious choice is Elizabeth Lee. That would represent real change. The first female leader of the Canberra Liberals since Kate Carnell. The final option I see is Jeremy Hansen. He's a former leader of the party. He ran a pretty close result back in 2016 and he might want another shot. Tom Lowry reporting there. ABC Canberra's data journalist Marcus Mannheim has been analysing the results and he joins me now. Just how tight are the margins for these three last seats? Well, about two thirds of all votes have been counted in full, Dan. That means with preferences. And on that basis, I can't remember seeing an election that was this close in some areas. Particularly, it's the battle for Belconnen that attracts attention. It's just seven votes, a tiny, tiny margin that separates Labor's Tamus Werner Gibbings from Jonathan Davis, the Greens candidate. So you can't help but imagine how frustrated one of those is going to feel at the end of the week. In Ginandera, it's a little bit different up in Belconnen Way. The margins there are in the hundreds of votes, but it's a three-way contest. You have Labor, the Liberals and the Greens all vying with a real chance and scrapping for two seats between them. So that three-way fight is just as unpredictable as what's going to happen in Belconnen, in, in Brindabella. Well, speaking of Gin and Dara, we're hearing that exhausted vote shaped the result there. What does that mean? Well, it, it's pretty simple. We have a lot of freedoms as voters in Canberra. We can number one box, we can number five boxes, we can number all 30 or so candidates if we like. What happened in Ginandera is that a lot of voters didn't number enough boxes for their vote to be counted in full. Now, that was particularly the case for Belco, Belco Party supporters. They numbered one to five for Bel Belco Party candidates and then stopped. And that was devastating for the Liberal Party and its chances. They picked up very few preferences as a result of that. So, unquestionably, the Belco Party was not helpful for the Liberal Party last night. Marcus, based on what's been counted so far, just how might the Assembly look? 
Uh, it won't be a majority Labor government. That dream for them has gone, so they'll be governing here with the Greens like they did last term. At the moment, what is most probable is 12 Labor seats, 8 Liberal and 5 Greens. But we'll know for sure at the end of the week. Marcus Mannheim reporting.